that was excellent. Well, baby, thank you so much. Well, the Lord is good all the time, right? Well, some years ago, a story is told of a young couple who moved to Banff, which is a town in the province of Alberta, Canada. Any Canadians among us here today? <laughs> well, this vacation paradise, located in the heart of the Canadian Rockies, is surrounded by majestic mountain peaks, like we have here in our Colorado Rockies. The awesome be beauty, the awesome beauty of the slopes changes with seasons. Glistening snow in the winter, bright wild flowers in the spring and summer, and golden autumn leaves. Well, for the first year or so, every time the couple walked outside, they stopped to admire the beauty of their mountain setting. They were sure they would never tire of the glorious sights that, that surrounded them. But guess what? They did. They got tired. It wasn't long until all that beauty had become so familiar that it didn't excite them anymore. Not only did it no longer excite them, or ad they didn't even admire it any longer, but also they didn't appreciate it any longer. Well, shortly after the Israelites escaped the, from Egypt into the wilderness, you remember the story, they ran out of food. But God heard their cry and fed them supernaturally with a daily supply of manna. I imagine for the first time, they were so incredibly in awe of God's provision for them, supernaturally coming every day. But you know, and I know the story, after a while, they grew tired of the same food day in and day out. You see, the familiar had lost its appeal and appreciation. What about you? And what about me? Do you ever find yourself becoming apathetic with all the blessings God showers upon you each day? Do you take them for granted? Do you remember to thank Jesus for his daily provision of life, of breath, of strength, and of course for the countless good things he gives you each day. Remember we sang, Jesus, thank you. Well, that's supposed to be the story of our message. Jesus, thank you. Well, this brings me to the heart of the message God has given me from his word today to deliver to you at this blessed hour in your life and my life. So please, I want you to listen carefully to it, not just with your head, but more importantly with your heart, where the Holy Spirit is ready and resolved to plant the seed of God's rich and refreshing truth. In order to do what? In order to change genuine born-again believers among us here today more into the marvelous and magnificent image of Jesus Christ, who is the desire, the delight the defender, and the deliverer of the church. And to convict unbelievers of their sin of unbelief, mercifully and miraculously leading them to genuine repentance and personal saving faith in who? Jesus Christ, who is the Holy One of God and the hope of the nation. So here's our message in a nutshell. Please, I humbly urge you, to pay very close attention to it with an open heart and an open mind. Willing to do what? Willing to embrace it and express it in your life through the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's the message for us today. Gratefulness. Everyone says gratefulness. Gratefulness. Say it with, say with, say with conviction. Gratefulness. That's good. 
<laughs> gratefulness, not grumbling, is what God wants to characterize the life of his believing people for all the good things he gives them each day. Amen. Simply put, living a life of gratitude is what God desires for his children. That is his believing born again children. You see, my friends, gratitude will never be out of style. Other things will come and go, but gratitude, if you are born again Christian, gratitude will never be out of style for you. So folks, friends, faithful followers of Christ among us here today, and fellow believers in the fold and flock, fellowship and family of God. How many of you here believe that you are part of the family of God? Um, Only a few of you. <laughs> well, I hope after this message, you can have confidence that you are part of the family of God. The Bible is going to vividly and visually show us today that God is not at all pleased with people who take his, grace, his gifts and blessings for granted. He's not at all pleased with people who gripe and grumble about what they don't have. God is not at all pleased with people who focus on what they lack rather than their focus on their Lord, who is willing, always willing, abundantly willing to meet every need of his believing children. In fact, it is very shocking and startling to see the readiness of the people of Israel to complain against Yahweh after all that he had done for them and all that he had planned to do for their lives. It is shocking, unthinkable, that these people, after experiencing many, many blessings of God, will be complaining against God. Well, please, if you have your Bibles today, quickly turn them to or your smartphone, some, some of you have smartphones, turn them to Numbers chapter 11, verse 1 to 6. Will you please listen carefully as I recite our Thanksgiving gospel service. This is our Thanksgiving gospel message. I'll recite it from the updated New American Standard Bible which is the most literal translation of the Bible, but you have other Bibles, so just use them. The Bible says in Numbers chapter 11, verse 1, Now the people became like those who complain of adversity in the hearing of the Lord. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. The people therefore cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died out. So the name of that place was called Tabera, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. The rabble who were among them had greedy desires. And also some of the sons, uh, also the sons of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt, and the kikimbis, and the melts, and the licks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now, our appetite is gone. There is nothing at all to look at except this manna. This is the word of God to the people of God. May the Lord add his blessing to the recital of his holy word. The, the stories in Numbers 11, chapter 11, appear to be a match of a set of incidents recorded earlier in Exodus, chapter 15, 
verse 22, all the way to chapter 16, verse 36. So if you take Exodus chapter 15, verse 22, all the way to chapter 16, verse 36, and you put Numbers 11, you put up together, we have the same things being repeated in, in, the, in, in those two uh, passages. You see, in each, in each case, <laughs> there is a three-day march. And then a set of complaints. And then the provision of manna and coils for the people to eat. So a pattern is being repeated in the lives of God's people. You ask, what is that pattern? Here is the pattern. Please listen carefully. It is the pattern of the people of God being ungrateful and God being unfailing in demonstrating what? His love, his mercy, and his goodness to them. May I say to us today, this pattern is being repeated in your life and my life today. You say, how do you know that? Well, we are people who are ungrateful most of the time. But God is unfailing in showing us and showering his love upon us. This is what we are going to see in this story today. Now, will you please listen carefully as we delve deeper into the, our gospel story to discover the challenging, convicting, and comforting spiritual lessons the Holy Spirit is so poised and prepared to impress upon our hearts today. The first challenging and convicting spiritual lesson the Holy Spirit wants to bring to your attention and to my attention to impress upon your heart and my heart is this. Focuses on the complaint of the people about their hardship. We will see that in the first part of verse 1. You see, when life is hard, when a going gets tough, God's people become what? A complaining bunch. This is what we are going to see for ourselves today. So what it, the Bible says in the first part of the verse 1, it says, now, now, pause and take note of this. Now, the, the people became like those who complain of adversity in the hearing of the Lord. Now, here's what makes their complaining quite disappointing. You see, the first 10 chapters, if you take Numbers chapter 1 to 10 and read them, you will discover that the people repeatedly obeyed the Lord. They completely obeyed the Lord and his direction. The Lord tells them to do this, they did it. He tells them to do that, they did that. They were continually obeying the command of the Lord in the first 10 chapters of Numbers. You will not find a single act of disobedience in the first 10 chapters of Numbers. It was like the people started well. But the question is, will they end well? You see, it's not how you start, but how you finish. But now, only three days after leaving Mount Sinai, you know, they stayed at Mount Sinai for one, almost one year, and now the Lord told them to leave. And they were leaving under the direction of the Lord. They were obeying the Lord in breaking camp from Mount Sinai or on the way to the promised land. But they began to complain about their hardship in the hearing of Yahweh who is the self-existing, the sovereign, and the supreme deity of the universe. You see, upon arrive, their arrival at a, at a resting place, the people be, began to be discontented with their situation. In other words, they were like those who complained bitterly in the ears of Yahweh of something bad. That is to say that they behave like people who groan and murmur 
because of some misfortune that had happened to them. You see, they, these people longed for the settled life of Egypt. Because when they were in Egypt, they were not breaking camp every now and then. They had their place. <coughs> so they wanted to have that settled life. No more picking bag and baggage, moving on the road to, to take a dangerous trek to the unknown. That was their thinking. We are tired of this taking, breaking camp, and then settling. We want a settled life. And some of you here want a settled life, which is not a bad thing. But to complain about it is what is the problem. I tell you, friends, complaining was their specialty. They were very good at complaining. The sad thing here is that they complained, listen carefully, to one another and nothing was accomplished. When they woke up in the morning, when they walk by the road, and when they wind down at night in their tents, guess what they did? Yep, your guess is right. They expressed dissatisfaction and discontent at the difficulties and the hardships in connection with their journey through the wilderness. And they did that again and again and again. And many of us here are good at complaining to each other. But may I say to us today, we need to learn to take our problems to the only person who can fix them for us. If I complain to you about something you can't fix, I wasted my time. And you wasted your time complaining to somebody who can't fix your problems. And that's what we are good at. Notice the Bible says, the Lord heard their complaints. He heard it. Now the point the Bible is making us here, making us, making here is that their complaining was what? Upward and loud. It's one thing to complain in your heart. But it's another thing to give it a voice and loudly make, <laughs> put it on a megaphone. That's basically what it did. Their complaining was loud to the point that the, it reached the ears of Yahweh in heaven. You see, that is a, the Bible's vivid way of expressing their sinful attitude of complaint. Of course, when I speak slowly, God hears. If I speak softly, he hears. But the Bible is showing us that these people complain such with uh, an angry spirit that it reached the heart, the, the ears of Almighty God. Well, having examined the complaints of the people about their hardship in verse 1, the Bible now brings us to the point of emphasizing the caution of Yahweh to his complaining people. Yahweh is going to caution his complaining people of impending judgment should they continue in their complaining ways. And he does so in a graphic manner. I wish he does it like he did it in this story. The second part of verse 1 says, And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outcasts of the camp. Know that Yahweh was displaced, displaced with his complaining people. But here is what he didn't do on this occasion. He was displeased, but he didn't destroy them in his righteous anger. He was angry. The Bible tells us his anger was kindled. But he didn't destroy them. Notice the Bible says the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the askers or the extremities of the camp. The askers of the camp were consumed but not the people. Actually the expression used here signifies 
not to burn a person, but to burn against. So that's what the Lord did. He sent a fire to burn against the people, but not to burn the people. In other words, it was a merciful caution to the people as a whole of a judgment that would be severe if they should continue complaining. So here is now two important questions must be asked at this juncture. First, why did the anger of the Lord burn in the first place? The people complained, and the Bible says the anger of the Lord burned. Why? Well, please listen. It was because the complaint of the people was directed against Yahweh himself and his lady. Remember, he told them to leave Mount Sinai and head towards the promised land. He told them. It was not Moses. So the people's complaint was actually against Yahweh himself. It was, the, it was like the people were murmuring against the Lord for making a mistake with their lives. You see, they were finding fault with God, and nothing pleased them at all. But God, listen carefully, they didn't consume them. Rather, he cautioned them using the fire of the Lord that burned among them. Oh, how merciful is our God. Well, the second question is, how did the fire of the Lord start, start to burn? How did it start? If there is a fire here, or if there is fire, you have the fire department coming to investigate how the fire started. So how did the fire start here in this story? Well, <laughs> whether it was ignited by a flash of lightning or in some other such way, cannot be, cannot be more exactly determined in this story. All that is plain or plainly taught in this passage is that the fire did not extend over the whole camp, but merely broke out at one end and was extinguished quickly at the intercession of Moses, which we'll look at in a minute. You see, God's goal in sending the fire to burn the askers of the camp was to do what? Was to caution his complaining people. That's all. He says, take it. Be careful, friends, my children. So in a vivid and visual way, he manifested his power to destroy so that he might inculcate or infuse a healthy fear, a wholesome fear of his holy majesty. So please, let me say to us today that if you are a Christian and your life is characterized by complaining, God will be giving you caution from time to time because he doesn't want to consume you right away. <laughs> In this story, he cautioned the people and the people will have to listen. Well, having emphasized the caution of Yahweh to his complaining people, the Bible now brings us to the point of elaborating on his teaching regarding the cry of the people and the care of Moses. We'll see that in verses 2 to 3. If a fire breaks out here, what are we going to do? Well, some of you here will run. I guess we all will run. And some people will be calling 911. Well, there was no 911 in the wilderness, so the people cried out to their leader. So this is what we see in verses 2 and 3. The Bible says, the people therefore cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died out. So the name of that place was called Tabera, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. Now, notice very carefully that the people didn't cry out to the Lord. I wonder why they didn't cry out to the Lord. Why? Well, 
they knew that their complaining attitude was affecting their relationship with Yahweh. And may I say to us today, a complaining attitude in your life and my life will affect our relationship with Jesus Christ. What should the people have done in the first place? The first thing they should have done is to humbly and honestly confess their complaining attitude to the Lord about their hardship. They didn't do that. But yet again, God, listen carefully, God will demonstrate his unfailing love to them. But you say, how did God de demonstrate his unfailing love to, to these people who were complaining against him? Well, I'm so glad you've asked. Please listen carefully now. Yahweh showered, his <laughs> showered upon them his unfailing love through the care and concern of Moses. You said, where is the care and concern of Moses? Here is the care and concern of Moses. He prayed to the Lord on their behalf instead of putting them off. He interceded for them instead of indicting them of, for complaining against the Lord. He entreated Yahweh on their behalf instead of what? Expressing his anger at the people. He called upon the Lord on their behalf instead of condemning them for complaining against the Lord. He poured out his heart to God on their behalf, instead of what? Picking a fight with them. No sooner had Moses finished praying that, than the, the fire, the Bible tells us, died out, literally sank down. So the fire was burning high, and all of a sudden, it just died out. You see, even though the people were ungrateful, this is the lesson I don't want you to miss. Even though the people were ungrateful, God again demonstrated what? His unfailing love to them. The people called the place where Moses prayed to bear because it meant burning or a place of burning. But here's an important spiritual lesson God wants us not to miss. God, listen, God responds to genuine, heartfelt, spirit-led prayer of his servant in order to demonstrate what? His unfailing love to his people. This is why our prayer team takes prayer for you seriously. Why? Because we want God to use us to demonstrate his unfailing love to you in whatever way you, you need that experience in your life. So to, tonight, when you hear the call for prayer, please take advantage of it. God may be demonstrating his what? Unfailing love to you through the prayers of my sisters here. Now, as we come to the fourth and final point of our gospel story, three questions must be asked. Did the people heed the caution of Yahweh given to them through the consuming fire? In other words, did they learn from what had just befallen them? Did they take to heart the unfailing love Yahweh had demonstrated toward them despite their ungrateful attitude? You know the answer and I know the answer. The people did it. They didn't. They didn't learn from what they had just what had just befallen them. They didn't discern the caution and the cautioning hand of Yahweh at all in the burning which broke out at the outskirts of the camp. That is why they that is why they gave utterance in loud murmurs to the discontent of their hearts in wanting what? Meat. So the people now, the Bible now brings us to the last point, and that is the complaint about their food. We'll see that in verses 4 to 6. The first ever complaint of the people in the book of Numbers 11 was about their hardship. Life is tough for us. That was their complaint. Now we see in verse four, verses 4 to 6, the Bible speaks of 
the second complaint stemming from what? Their greed for food other than what? The man. So in verses 4 to 6, what the Bible tells us, the rabble who were among them had greedy desires. And also the sons of Israel went again and said, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt. The cucumbers and the melons and the licks and the onions and the garlic. But now our appetite is gone. There's nothing to look at. There's nothing I thought to look at except this man. Notice who is behind the complaint of their diet, about their diet. Well, the Bible says it all started by the rabble who were among God's chosen people. The rabble were the troublemakers on this occasion. Beware of troublemakers among you. <laughs> you ask, now, who are the rabble? Well, the Hebrew word translated rabble occurs only one time in the Bible here in this story. And literally, it means a collection and a mixed group of people. It is also translated mixed multitude. It is an appropriate term for the non-Israelites, a group of people who followed the Israelites out of Egypt. In other words, the rabble were not Hebrews. They were not Hebrews. In fact, the rabble or the mixed multitude of non-Israelites was the source of continual grief to the Israelites, causing them to long with intense craving for the food of Egypt and to despise the man manna. You see, after over a year of eating manna in the wilderness, the mixed multitude wanted the spicy food of Egypt. Once again, they felt and expressed a longing for the better food which they had enjoyed in Egypt and urged on the Israelites to cry out for meat again, especially the fish and the savory vegetables which are abounded in Egypt. They wanted a better kind of food than the bread-like <laughs> manna. You see, fish was abundant in the Nile, and the vegetables mentioned in verse 5 were cultivated in immense quantities and sold so cheaply in the market that the poor, as well as the rich, can enjoy refreshing flesh and cooling juice. But all these things, none of them is to be had in the wilderness. Therefore, the people did what they did best, that is to complain. In their complaint, they said, let me put it in our language for us, our appetite is gone. Literally, our soul is dried up. Our soul is fainting for want of savory, spicy, and refreshing food. We see nothing before our eyes but the manna, which has no juice <laughs> and supplies no vital nourishment. We long for the juicy and savory and the delicious food of Egypt. We want the buffet type of meal that we had in Egypt. We have many choices then for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner. We can choose from any of these. But here, we don't. Only this good for nothing matter. You see that people had forgotten what God had done for them in the past and is still doing for them now. Now that they were in a, in a new type of dis distress, what did they do? They glamorized the past and minimized the hardships of the past. And that's what we do. We talk about the good old days. I said we didn't have we didn't have hardships, troubles. Instead of counting their blessings, the people complain. Instead of giving thanks for all God has done and continue to do for them, out of His unfailing love, they grumbled. 
Instead of marveling at the goodness of God being shown to them, they daily murmured. And instead of worshiping Yahweh as their provider, they whined and wept. So please listen carefully. Before we judge the Israelites harshly, it's helpful for us to think about what occupies our attention most of the time. Are we grateful for what God has given us? Or are we always thinking about what we would like to have? <laughs> you see? We have, there's something we have, but we are always looking over there for what we don't have. <laughs> Is that how we live? Well, so what do we take away from our message today? Please listen carefully. If you are already a genuine born-again believer in Jesus Christ, this is what the Holy Spirit wants you to take away from his message to you and to me. First of all, in complete dependence on the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, confess to Jesus today your attitude of what? Complaining. I often catch myself complaining, and I have to confess it to Jesus and ask for what? His cleansing, his deliverance, and pardon. Chances are today you complain about something. Second, choose daily to count your blessings and complaining will diminish in your life. Have you counted your blessings today? Not since I lost my counter. <laughs> Have you named them one by one? <laughs> to see what God has done for you? The Israelites didn't do that. Then for... Third, cultivate an attitude of gratitude to God and be content with what you have. And then fourth, call on Jesus today to meet the needs in your life rather than complaining to people who can't help you, who can't fix your problems. Whatever your need today, whether it is, to, it is for deliverance from cravings that you have for alcohol, for drugs, for all those things, or your, your desire to do what? To begin to count your blessings and name them one by one. Please come and we will pray with you. Now, if you are not a born again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, may I humbly, honestly, and heartily say, say to you today that Jesus loves you. God loves you. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting, Everlasting life. life. Eternal life. And Jesus said, anyone who comes to me, I will in no wise cast away. So how do you experience that everlast everlasting life? Simply come to Jesus today just as you are. Confess to Jesus today that you are a sinner. And then call on the name of Jesus with simple and sincere childlike faith, believing that he died on the cross for your sins, that he was buried to put away your sins, and that he rose again on that third day to bring you into what? A right standing with a holy God. And the Bible says you will be saved and set apart. So today, God has spoken to you. If you have any need as a believer, please come here. My sisters who come will pray for you. But if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, you come here and talk to me. We have time, so don't be in a rush to live. What is your prayer need today? Don't live here without experiencing God's 